Ladies and gentlemen, this is Jay Michaels, and here we are, and we are bringing you some fantastic television, courtesy of the Boston Sci-Fi Film Festival number 49. That's right, you heard that number, 49 years and going strong. America's leading genre film festival brings you the finest in futuristic films and television programs. And I'm thrilled to be here with them once again. Now, I failed math in college, but I know enough that 49 is followed by 50. And next year, the Boston Sci-Fi Film Festival turns one half of a century. So these amazing filmmakers essentially are heralding this huge event. And I'm thrilled to be chatting with them about it. To learn more about them and all of what Boston Sci-Fi has, you go to bostonsci-fi.com for schedules, for information, not only for the actual event at the Somerville Theater, but also for the virtual festival that goes on online. Um, okay, let's start at the top of my screen here. Matt, Tell us about the amazing film that you're bringing to this amazing festival. Uh, first, uh, first up, okay, great. Uh, my name is Matthew. I'm from uh, I'm from Montreal in Canada. Um, my film's called Reborn. It's an animated film. Uh, my day job is visual effects. Um, I've been doing it for 20 years, and I finally decided to make my own short film, which was a dream of mine forever. Um, so I just I went for it. Uh, what I did is I spent a few hours every evening for four or five years and uh, made this film completely on my own. So uh, here we are. I've been on the festival circuit for about a year now and i um, super stoked to be part of the Boston Sci-Fi uh, Festival. I think it's great. So I got two questions for you. The first is you say made it on your own. Are you the actor, writer, director, producer, Cameraman, did you do all of that? Are you the auteur, as it were? Well, every part of it, yes. I mean, it's uh, computer graphics, the whole deal. Um, so it's fully animated. Uh, I, did, I acted the mocap, I could put it that way. I was wearing the mocap suit in my living room, freaking my family out. Um, so yeah, I did every step of the way. It was part of the fun also, just to do it on my own. Uh, like I said, my day job is a big collaborative teamwork where I bring the vision of a director to the screen. Uh, but now is an opportunity for me to just bring my ideas to the, to the screen. So it was, uh, it was part of the fun just to do it on my own. That's absolutely wonderful. And you were in the motion capture suit. I could just see you in your living room and, and your family says, what is he doing? Shh, I'm working. That's <laughs> great. That's I did not film that at all. So <laughs> it's, uh, nobody's gonna see that. Oh, okay. Uh, tell us about the movie. What's uh, what, what's it about? Well, it's a science fiction film. Um, Duh. What's it? Uh, exactly. It's about an elderly man who's on a spaceship. And uh, we piece together that he was born on this ship. Uh, he was on a mission that was too long for the lifetime of one person. Uh, so these two... Um, these two other people on board had a child and then uh, he had to pursue the mission, not exactly knowing what it was. And this is what we discover with him, what his purpose was and where he's going and what he's going to be achieving in his life. And he never left the starship. Nope. He was stuck on it, nowhere to go and uh, not exactly knowing where he was going, but that's his life. And that's, that's what he lived. You're, you're giving us a very powerful message about workaholism, and that's hitting me hard, let me tell you. Uh, really interesting. What was the inspiration? Um, funny enough, it just um, sounds kind of strange, but it came in a dream, like I dreamed up this scenario, like, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, and it just stuck in my mind, I had to do something about it at some point in my life, and then... Like I said, like I just went for it at some point. I had to do it. So uh, that's that's where it came about. Then I'm congratulating you on that. So many people, especially during the pandemic, invested in potato chips. But but you you said, OK, this idea is in my head. It must be real. And I think that's wonderful. When is your film happening at the festival? It's happening on the Wednesday night. I think it's opening night, actually. Uh, so uh, check it out. It's going to be night. Uh, 
It's going to be fun. You. Good for you. Wish you the best you. of luck. Sounds fascinating. And I'm so glad it's an older person in it. Thank you. I'll just leave my comment at that. Good for you. Jason. Thank you. My pleasure. Jason, enlighten us. What what cautionary tale are you providing? <laughs> Um, well, first of all, thank you for uh, doing this. It's always a pleasure to get to, to chat about film and be among so many other filmmakers. Uh, but I've got a, a short sci-fi horror film called The Reclaimers. It is about a young woman named Reagan who uh, is sort of on a revenge mission after these invisible creatures take over her town and kill her grandparents. Uh, so she sort of sets off on this task uh, to destroy all of their nests that are around town. Uh, the catch is that they're invisible. So the only sort of guide she has is her dog, Boone, who can actually see everything. Um, so it's sort of a, a story about companionship and uh, a little bit of vengeance and things thrown in there with the theme of finding hope in hopeless situations. Uh, but it was a lot of fun to shoot. I My dog is actually one of the stars of the movie. So that was a lot of fun to sort of train her over a few months and kind of figure out how we were going to do that and shoot that, you know, using treats and my wife, you know, off screen yelling her name and things like that. But uh, we had a lot of fun making it. And Hopefully it's uh, sort of a nice, thrilling, moving little film. I, I always, whenever I see animals on, uh, uh, whenever I see animals on uh, uh, the screen in a film, I'm, I, I always notice every once in a while they'll look to the side somewhere and I say, ah, there's the trainer over there on the side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That in this case, you'll know it's my wife. And it's so funny. My cat is yowling in the background. So if you can hear her too, I guess she's jealous that she wasn't in the movie, but a bit harder to train. I'm uh, I'm relieved yeah. because I thought it was my cat doing it. Good. Okay, good. I'm glad it's your cat. She's been she's been quiet all day, but naturally, you know, the second that we do this, she's like coming in here screaming, but it is what it is. That's why they're cats. Uh, exactly. You have, a, you have an interesting parable in here. Why'd you make them invisible? Um, I mean, if I'm being completely honest, there's certainly something to say about, you know, a low budget. Um, I do a lot of I definitely come from the indie DIY side of filmmaking and you know, try to find ways that I can craft stories, you know, using my resources and uh, without breaking the bank too much. But I, I really was interested in the idea. I've always been interested in the idea of animals being able to sort of see things in a different level or having that additional sense, you know, that humans don't have. Uh, and my dog, funnily enough, gave me the idea based around uh, just uh, we, we, we take a lot of walks. I mean, she's the one that keeps me in shape most of my life. And uh, nine times out of 10, if we're on a walk, she always seems to kind of see something. And, you know, I'm sure it's nothing for the most part, but that there was a particularly eerie uh, moment after a storm where you're taking a walk and she was insistent there was something down this empty street and was growling and barking at it. And I, I think it was maybe that night that I came home and wrote the first draft of this script. So um, certainly, certainly wanted to explore. I work a lot in the, the horror comedy space as well, and I wanted to do something a bit more dramatic. Uh, and again, just kind of wanted to do something with my dog. <laughs> You, you bring up an interesting point because even in the genres, we, we tend to create our villains. We tend to, to personify or at least you know put a shape to our villains. But when you really think about it in the world today, the things we need to fear most are the things we cannot see. Uh, I, can give a, I can give a parable to the pandemic very easily. Anybody know what, a, what, a, what, what the COVID germ really looks like? No, we just, we just have our thoughts on it. So it's like, we need to we need to think about the cautionary tale even if we can't see what it is coming after us. So you have a really interesting message in there. When does the show happen? It happens on Friday, and it's I'm trying to remember the name of which theater it's playing in. I've got the schedule up. Uh, it's 5 p.m. in the shorts program at the Somerville Theater, um, and that's the 16th. Friday at five. Perfect. People can go see your film and then they can go to dinner somewhere and talk all about how uh, the, the deep message in there. And then they could feel all creeped out because there's something invisible behind them in the restaurant after the film. Couldn't ask for more. Thank you. you go. Good, for, good for you. Good for you. Much luck. Congratulations on it. Aaron, it. Aaron, scare me. What's your film? Hello. Um, so my flick is called Subject 7, um, and it's basically an interrogation scene that takes place during the Cold War. Uh, our main character um, basically claims to have supernatural remote viewing capabilities, um, but the person tasked with investigating this is, of course, suspicious. Uh, does the test subject have psychic abilities, or is he a Soviet spy? How else would he have access to this classified information? 
Um, so it's a bit of a cat and mouse kind of verbal sparring thriller uh, inspired by some of the more crazy MK Ultra experiments that the CIA conducted, uh, some of which which lasted until the 1990s. Um, uh, yeah, that's basically the pitch. <laughs> You, you. Uh, it, it's interesting. On my screen here, you're you're right next to Jason, and so we have two films about the invisible enemy, whether it's psychic powers or it's just something we can't see. So I'm I'm seeing a pattern forming here. You're also uh, when we talk about the Cold War, we get to think James Bond and things like that. Right now, we look at it with this romantic espionage thing, but the Cold War never ended. And and when we talk about world affairs right now, no, the war is not ending. So you're making a very powerful statement with your piece. Um, what what gave you the idea? Um, to be honest, it started as a music video. Um, I was I was it, I was shot in a studio that I was renting at the time and I was getting kicked out of it. But um, I the original I, idea was uh, basically the artist was going to be rapping and an examiner was kind of trying to figure out what he was saying with instruments and microphones and stuff like that. Um, and then that fell apart because the artist moved away. Uh, and I had a couple weeks left in the studio space and I was just kind of stuck on these images of sort of vintagey sci-fi, you know, it was, uh, originally using like, um, a polygraph machine and, you know, that kind of low tech, high tech, if that makes any sense. So, um, it's actually really impossible to find a polygraph machine. So I had to switch that out for something else, but, um, yeah, I just kind of was stuck with these images. I had this space that I was kind of already paying for. Um, so it all kind of came together. I wrote a script in a week or two, um, got some friends to shoot it, put out a casting call for one of the roles. Um, I knew one of the actors before, um, and we shot it in an afternoon and, it's the little wow. film that could so far. So yeah, here we are. Indie guerrilla filmmaking. There is nothing like it in the world. Um, yeah. That's interesting. I always look at things that that we look at that we call retro. It gives us a chance to really look at at our past and how we allowed our past to to mold our future. Really interesting. When does your when does it go up? Uh, Saturday the seventeenth in the last shorts block on Saturday. Very cool. A Saturday night gig. There you go. You can't beat that in terms of timing. Good for you. Congratulations. I wish you much luck with that. Jorge, hey. tell us tell us all about your your cautionary tale. <laughs> Hello. Um, so I co-directed the film um, One Small Step, uh, which I co-directed with my friend, uh, Nacho Garbia. He couldn't be here today because he's in Spain. We're both from Spain. But I'm I'm based in LA, which you know the time difference is not not as bad. Just a bit. Um, yeah, <laughs> just three hours here is like nine hours in Spain. Um, but yeah, I co-directed the short film with him. It's called uh, One Small Step. Uh, it's a very short short film, and it's about this astronaut who's in the middle of a mission that could change the way we understand the universe and the way we understand uh, life in other planets. I don't want to give too much away, uh, but it doesn't end well. I would say that. Uh, and yeah, it's this very low budget sci-fi uh, that we shot in my parents' garage back in, in Madrid. Uh, and yeah, we had a lot of fun doing it, building the spaceship. Uh, we learned to saw just to make like the spacesuit and the astronaut, like the helmet and all that. So it, it was a lot of fun. You 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 touch on something in, in a previous interview. I had two artists, that both their films had a spiritual base. And when we're talking about changing our views on the universe, I always wonder why people don't accept that there maybe are UFOs or what do they call them now? Uh, uh, I don't even know the new initials that they they try to fool us with. But the people deny the presence of them, and I always thought because if we think that there's life on other planets, how does how does that affect us spiritually? And so you you're kind of tapping on that when you say you know it could affect the way we look at the universe and life on other planets. Uh, what inspired you? What's what what was the impetus for such a film? Right. Yeah. Well, um, I guess we both like Nacho and I. We both like science fiction. I'm a huge fan of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I think that book, even though it's a very funny book, it has that kind of philosophical, I don't know, uh, backset in a way. Uh, and it goes. Uh, it kind of ties into what you were saying. I think a lot of sci-fi gives us perspective and realize what our place in the universe is and how small we are and how our planet is just 
a computer built by mice, like in, in uh, you know, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So I think we were trying to go for that in a way. There was there was a, a, a an animation on uh, the show Love and Robots on Netflix, and it was it, we think it was very funny when you first look at it. It's very funny. It's this animation about a zombie apocalypse, and it's sort of like this animation of of watching our our world go from a regular world into being devoured by these zombie creatures. And then at the very end, you see a shot uh, like like someone is about to explode a bomb that will end the Earth. And they press the button and then it goes to this shot of the universe and and you suddenly see this little blip. It goes peep, and you get the idea the earth <laughs> is no longer. And you suddenly realize, wow, what, what we consider is so earth shaking, pardon the pun. When you look at the broad scheme of the universe, who are we? You, you, I, I, I hope people don't come out going, oh, my God, I hope people don't come out depressed <laughs> right. Are, oh, we're it's so funny small. With, with the show film, we're going for a comedy, but I think there is that that feeling of like, well, we're so tiny in the universe, and and you know, if the if the entire planet disappear and humankind disappear, well, the the universe like wouldn't care. Well, well, maybe what they'll do, they'll walk out thinking like you all already think all of you already think this way that okay, it, maybe I'm one small part of it, but I'm going to do my most most to make sure that I make a, a, a mark on the world with my films, with my art, with everything. So I congratulate you immensely on, on saying, okay, we're a blip in the universe, but here's my personal blip. When does your personal blip go up in the festival? Uh, so it's playing next Friday, the 16th at 5.15 PM. And I think the theater is the Somerville Theater. There you go. Perfect time. They go see your film. Then they go to one of the fine restaurants over there and they discuss their contribution to the universe good for you much luck to you on that Thank you. jillian tell us all about your masterpiece hi uh yeah my film is called dandelion and it's about a woman that lives in a wind turbine um in a field of wind turbines and uh, something really awful has happened in her past and she decides to uh, kill herself um and it's not a comedy <laughs> and uh, and that's kind of where the film starts and then um strange things happen and her um hu dead husband visits her um through various ways and um yeah it's just it's a bit of a weird one <laughs> that's a dark film oh my goodness yeah it's quite dark what uh what what prompted such a such a thought process from you um it was really i I'm Scottish, but I live in London and I used to travel up and down the train a lot um, across the UK and there's loads of wind turbines on the way and I used to just look out. I think they're beautiful. And I was like, oh, you know, who could live in a place like this and what would their life be like? And, you know, why would they live there? Uh, and the kind of that was the kernel of the, the idea that just sort of grew from there. I work in visual effects. So I wanted to do something to do like that. I could do lots of visual effects myself to, you know, make it look good, hopefully. Um, yeah, so that that was it, really. I, I give you I give you credit because you gave yourself a challenge. You looked out at it and said, "Oh, this is beautiful," and and yet you said, "Okay, so the people live here. Do they think it's beautiful?" And you went in the other direction. It looks like. Uh, yeah, yeah. My mind always goes to the dark side. <laughs> that's really interesting. You give yourself these challenges. I give you a lot of credit for that. That's really intense. Uh, most of us say, "Okay, what, what's the expression? Write what you know." But but you're saying, <laughs> okay, "This is this is what I know. This is what I'll do." Good yeah. for you. Good for you. When does it happen? Uh, it's Friday, eight o'clock. Friday, eight o'clock. There you go. Prime time on the weekend. There yeah. you go. Well, I hope everyone comes out enjoying your film and not utterly miserable. I so. hope so too. <laughs> Hopefully it's a little bit optimistic at the end, but it's sort of, you know, okay. leaves you so. as yeah. long as there's a little bit of optimism at the end. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure it's going to be brilliant regardless. Thank you. Best of luck Thank you. to you. Thank you. Mark, tell us about your film. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you, Jay. Thanks uh, to the festival for having us. Uh, my name is Mark Kiefer. I'm the writer director of a short film called Source Code, and uh, Source Code is was produced by the, the Atlantic Council, which is a DC-based nonpartisan think tank focused on national security and foreign policy issues, and ultimately. The film is about the role of AI in the future of war and the impact of isolation on the core elements of our humanity. And it was written, believe it or not, both before COVID and chat GPT, but suffice to say, I think it's very timely 
uh, all of a sudden right now. It's set during uh, a war taking place about 40 years in the future where the military leadership has been quarantined on a remote base in a secret location to keep our adversaries from hacking their DNA. And it centers around one of the officers who is visiting the base psychiatrist after his mistakes have sort of cost lives on a faraway battlefield. Uh, I, I, I'm a commentator for a program called Jaywatch and we talk about classic television and we always talk about classic science fiction and horror and how clairvoyant they are in the 1950s. They were episodes that talked about pandemics and about war and about so many things that if we just watched it a little harder, then it might be a different world today. So you're, you're giving us a, a, a really interesting cautionary parable and the fact that it was written before any of this became a reality shows that that you're in that same clairvoyancy why'd you write it, it did, oh, it's one thing to say oh we had a pandemic and now i'm writing about a pandemic oh we have chat gpt so now i'm writing about it where did right. it come from in your brain then it uh, is actually based on i adapted the script from a short story written by a guy named uh, jamie metzel who is a quite uh, well-known sort of technology futurist and has been thinking about these kinds of issues particularly around genetic engineering and so forth wrote a whole book on the subject uh, recently uh, for a number of years. And it's part of a broader program at the Atlantic Council to use the arts. It's, it's quite interesting to use the arts uh, to help spark a conversation uh, generally uh, in the country about the impact of war on our men and women in uniform. Obviously, uh, there's been uh, a lot of that, which is to say war over the last couple of decades. Uh, and the hope is that if uh, the average American better understood the toll of war on soldiers and their families, we might make better decisions in the public policy realm going forward. And so that is the underlying inspiration uh, for all of this. I, I, I lecture at several universities, and there was one where a, a major portion of my students for that lecture were uh, former military people. And they would tell me stories about what happened to them at war. And I have never been an advocate for war ever. But after speaking to them, I am even less mm -hmm. an advocate. Uh, I have never been an advocate of war. And, and now I realize what it does to these soldiers. I think it's a I think it's there's no such thing as war crimes. It's the crime of war. Uh, I, 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 I applaud you deeply for for going on that level i think we need to understand this i think we need to hear this very importantly uh when does this happen uh it will be screening in the short film block uh next thursday the 15th at 8 p.m uh also at the somerville theater excellent 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 uh congratulations and thank you i'm being flipped thank you for your service thank you for for handing us a, a message that we must all pay attention to all your messages are something that i could say watch the skies but but your your message thank you thank you very much for 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 doing that thank you heinrich, heinrich tell us about your film hello thank you my name is henrik pilerud and i'm a swedish filmmaker and it's called uh, call of the unseen and it's my first feature film uh, and uh, it's been a process making it uh, through the pandemic and everything. Uh, I can't really recommend pandemics when you're making film, uh, but we, we got through it. And uh, it, uh, yeah, I'm very happy that, that it could, could be made uh, and, and be my feature debut. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, I had a colleague who made a, a horror film during the pandemic, and he did it all on Zoom. He oh, yeah? based his plot so that everyone was quarantined and all of this. And and he told he told me stories about how he would have to do something, then he'd have to email it to his editor to fix it, and then it had to go back, and then he would get tests with his actors and tell them to fix the lighting in their in their homes when they were doing it. Yeah, you're right. I think. Uh, I, I think pandemics uh, maybe gave us a lot of time to do something, but we needed the time to just figure things out. What's yeah. your film about? Yes, it's it's about uh, facing your inner fears and, and get out of your comfort zone and uh, exploring the unknown. Uh, there is an uh, um, art theme. It's an art student who... 
uh, whose uh, teacher uh, and mentor disappears in mysti mystical circumstances and she has to to set out and, and find him so he can uh, make her a better student or at least that's what she, she thinks she needs to do. Uh, and that's the journey that takes her uh, into the unknown where she meets uh, fantastical creatures. Uh, so it's a kind of a sci-fi and fantasy mix with uh, mysterious technology, but also uh, trolls and goblins. And and every filmmaker and every playwright and everyone like that needs to send you a thank you note because <laughs> you just did a film which is the parable of any great artist because you're basically saying what happens when your mentor when your teacher disappears what do you do do you stop or do you continue on and and create more fantastical creatures uh, on your own so so you basically gave us the sci-fi story of what all of the artists in the world go through yes and it's very much uh, for me what has been like to make this film is also the getting out of my comfort zone and exploring the unknown by making the film and taking the risks and spending all my money and uh, five years uh, of my life doing this um, and it's been quite a journey and I learned a lot from it um, but yeah that, that is the the message of the film is to to get out there and there are dangers but you grow as a person as well money comes and goes it's it's it, it will never stay long but the illumination that one gets from from our journey is really what counts that's great exactly congratulations when does it uh, when does it appear it will be in the virtual program uh, streaming uh, during the weekend. And I'm not sure if it's going to be in one of the theaters also, but at least in the virtual program. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are an artist, that's your required reading. And it's on a virtual platform. So don't tell me you can't get to Boston. You can get to your screen. So if you are an artist, uh, I'm giving you a homework assignment to watch this film. Congratulations. Good luck to you with that film. Uh, David, tell us about your film. You're an excellent marketer. You got all your posters right behind you there. That's oh, it. yeah. Yeah, these, I wish I wish these were my posters. Yeah. Well, well we, get the, we get the idea what yeah. you do. Let's yeah, just say. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. So thank, thanks first off for having me a part of the festival, but I'm really one half of uh, what this film is. Um, I'm uh, in a brother-sister writing team with uh, my sister, Kelly Tappan. Uh, she's a writer and an actress. I'm a writer and a director. And, you know, this is our flagship project that we launched together. Our passion uh, is character-driven stories with a high concept twist. Um, so that's sort of what we strove for in this film. Uh, you know, it was, it's was it been a passion project for 18 months plus. Uh, we're excited to get it out there. Um, it's called Universe 25. It's about a girl played by my sister. Uh, she's abducted by a mysterious entity and forced to participate in a dark psychological experiment. Uh, she's trapped in a room. She has one roommate. And every 30 days, the roommate is replaced with somebody new. Um, and she has no idea where they go or who's taking them. Um, but essentially, uh, you know, she's guaranteed one thing. And that one thing is that for the rest of her life, she will only know any person for 30 days. No longer. No less. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a it's a dark film, but we wanted to sort of inspire some hope along the way as well. Inspiring hope by knowing someone for 30 days. Okay. I, uh, uh, I could give a snarky message to that, but okay. Where did this idea come from? Well, yeah, the, the idea came from, you know, the, the hope angle, which sort of pays off at the end, which is, uh, I feel like we're, we're living in a, in a time where there's a lot of uncertainty and anxiety, um, where we don't really know what is going to happen in the future. So similar to our character, um, you know, things can be taken from you at any moment. And um, it's how do you find peace amidst that chaos of life? Um, so it's, it's really a journey of a woman who's broken down by this room and then is built back up again um, by finding a way to find peace and happiness through this uh unstable sort of life so in a way it's sort of it's a metaphor for life and a metaphor for you know the the sorts of things that that we go through it's also a metaphor for the abuse that we get from the purveyors of social media in terms of algorithms how many of us look at our facebook's or our instagrams and say where's my buddy why haven't i seen what's going on with them because somehow the algorithm has changed and they're gone 
And, yeah. and so, yeah, you know someone for 30 days. I don't know how many times I live, and I live on social media, I'm supposed to, but uh, uh, I feel like Max Hedrum sometimes. And and uh, I, I think to myself, where's where's my buddy? Where Why haven't I seen what's going on on their feed? Because they're gone. So yeah. for you to say, we know someone for 30 days, what happened? The algorithm changed? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well... Yeah, that that's the mystery of the film. You know, you'll have to to watch it to find out. But there's there's a nice sci-fi payoff to the whole thing that I think uh, will have everyone uh, excited. So, yeah. oh, of course, there's a sci-fi payoff. <laughs> and Rod <laughs> Serling would would turn in his grave if there wasn't something like. That. <laughs> when does it happen? When does it go up? Yeah, so we're part of the virtual program one on the nineteenth through the twenty fifth. So keep an eye out for us, ladies and gentlemen. Get on get on your virtual screen and see it now because. It might be gone in 30 days. <laughs> Good for you. Good luck to you. Congratulations. Interesting, interesting parable you have going on there. Mr. Herring, tell us about you. I call you by uh, your yeah. first name, but uh, DM. Thanks for having me. DM, yeah, you can call me that. My okay. name is David, but that's fine. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my film's Floater. It's a uh, about a guy locked in a bathroom. Uh, but a uh, it's about a guy... Uh, a uh, brother and sister discover their father dead on the toilet on the bathroom floor. Um, and after the funeral, he has a mental breakdown and locks himself in the bathroom and then tries to recreate the traumatic memories of his youth in a happier way to deal with his grief and his trauma. So it's a very strange movie. <laughs> in the place where his father passed away. Exactly. Yeah. And that's yeah. Where did that come from? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I, I, it started as a short story I wrote, uh, 11 years ago. I had a really traumatic year in my life. Um, I, I lost a lot of people. I had a relationship end, and then, um, I had my, my best friend growing up who had then become my bully in high school, um, uh, died in a terrorist attack. And, uh, I got the news and I, I had a full on breakdown because I didn't know how to process that grief because this was someone that I loved. That was my first friend in the world and then became like my mortal enemy. And then he died in this really horrific way. Um, and I didn't know how to process that. And I, it was almost like this, I've never had this happen before. I sat down and this story kind of poured out of me. Um, and I didn't know what to do with it. It felt radioactive for a very long time. That's why it took me so long to do anything with it, but I ended up getting it published and, I just always saw it so visually. Um, so like sitting around during the pandemic, I, I I was actually trying to shoot something before the pandemic hit. And then it allowed me time to sort of revisit this and realize I'm like, I think in order to move on from that trauma, I needed to shoot it and, and make it my first. I mean, this is the first thing I've directed. So it had to be that. I am so sorry to hear that that yeah, thank uh, you. tragedy uh, <laughs> gave birth to this. Um, yeah. I commend you. Uh, so many of us sit with our tragedies and we just let it fester inside of us and change our lives, not for the better. You said, I, 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 I'm not gonna go through therapy. I'm I'm gonna go through I, filmmaking. And you, I am going through therapy. I've been in therapy well, a long time. Uh, well, there you go. But you said- <laughs> but This was my, a different kind of therapy. And it was, it was really, I mean, it helped me move on. It was the best therapy. So I'm like, shoot your therapy. I, that sounds weird, but do it. Just shoot your trauma, it actually helps. I, I think it's brilliant. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I've, I've always said that we don't learn from the newspapers. We don't look at the realities of war unless we can watch it in a movie somewhere and we could step away from it mm -hmm. and, and think it happens to other people or other universes or whatever else. And then finally it'll sink in. We can't do it in our own world. And, and you've proven that. Now I understand the bathroom because this is all alone in your own thoughts and 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 riddle me this, Batman, what room in our house is the only place where we could say that we're alone, that we could really be alone? And that's our bathroom. I won't go into detail why, but nonetheless, uh, it, it, it makes total sense. It makes total sense. When you first said it, I was like, wow, thank goodness they legalized marijuana. This guy's doing good. But, <laughs> but, but no, it's, it's, it's this deep, deep thought that when we're alone, you, you found the place where you can combat what what goes on in your life also it's very interesting that it's based on someone who is both a friend and an enemy so you're you're looking at how our universe you're not saying my best friend you're not saying my hated enemy that the, the, 
this is our universe. You're, you're saying I had to contemplate the universe in the only place where I could be quiet to do so. And, and it's real. That's really brilliant. When does it happen? Uh, it's screening virtually. So the, I think I forget the dates, but they set it before us. And there you go. And ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> as we all know from the cyber world, you can watch any film on your phone in your bathroom. <laughs> so since he is on the virtual screen, you can watch it anywhere you wish and contemplate his universe when you're alone contemplating yours. Now we're talking universe. I've saved the best for last. Um, this gentleman has been part of Boston sci-fi. I think, I think uh, uh, the only thing Boston was famous for before this gentleman was there was tea. Uh, so, so I'm absolutely thrilled. And I've had the pleasure of meeting him last year. And I've had the pleasure of speaking to him countless times over the years for this interview book program. He is literate. He is charming. He is brilliant. He is brave. The fact that he's sitting there in his wizard suit does it all. Uh, we have an individual that really cares for his students. If you follow him on Facebook, uh, I wish I had teachers like him when I was going to school. I, I think all the things that screw me up would not have happened if I had him, <clears throat> if I had him as a mentor. And it is always a pleasure to speak to him. And the films that he comes up with every year, he is a wizard. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Professor Bob White. Bob, it is wonderful to see you once again. Tell me about you. Tell me what you've brought us this year. What's new? Hey, Jay, Jay, no pressure, right? I mean, holy. <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome, Maestro Jay, and congratulations to all of the filmmakers. And don't believe anything that that lad just said. Oh, look at this. It's fake. It's me head. Um, and uh, I have a film live. Let's see. Is it coming through there? Oh, oh Thursday at 8 p.m. I'm in person with my little movie, and it's got some things that you see in the sky behind me. This is all magic. There's no technology attached. None whatsoever. Let's see. Oop, oop, oh, oh, scary, scary. Okay. Um, there's a dragon rider and uh, crystal angels. And uh, what else have we got in the tube here? We got blood. I know we got monsters. It's just a wind up toy, a fantasy meditation. Your fantasy meditation no, is. Oh, I'm not done yet. Be quiet. Be quiet. Don't interrupt. <laughs> and it's got blood fueled feeding tubes for monsters uh, hatching a hive of insect monsters and creatures and the like. And I'm sorry I yelled at you. If you were in my class, definitely you'd be screwed up. Oh, here we go. Oh, terrifying. Shut your eyes. It's monsters, monsters, and more monsters. What is the name of this film, my lord? A Sky Weave Dalian. Six minutes, computer animation. Which you've all done yourself, right? Every bit of it is you. I woke up one morning and it was on my doorstep. I think that the gnomes made it, you know, eat the baby. How long have you been teaching? Can I ask that question? 53 years in one place and about three before that. I So that's math. I know you didn't have good math stuff. So for 56 years, you have been you have been part of the lives of students. Thank you. Yes, I have. I have damaged lives for 52 years. 52 years, okay. 53, whatever, whatever the number is. See, I told you the math was not good. I failed math in college, so don't worry about that. Uh, I, I can't help you on there. Uh, Bob, just that little bit you you have behind you, and just by the fact that effortlessly here, you just, here, let me show you my film, boom. Um, from what I from what I've seen on on social media, like I say, the faces of your students as they're talking to you, that says everything. Your your uh, your use of articulation and everything is absolutely marvelous. What is this about? You've given us the cast of characters. What is this film about? It's about six minutes long. I think Bob Dylan said that. Let me see. It, <clears throat> the dragon rider pays a visit to this hive of monsters, and uh, maybe the salvation attached. Don't want to get too spiritual. Trauma, monsters, monsters and monsters. Shall I tell you about my trauma? Please. Oh, something's ringing. 
When I was three years old, I had surgery on my eyes. And back then, a child was taken away from their parents, and I was. And I was etherized upon a table, and ether, and my tiny baby face, they put a mask on it, and ether smelt. They don't do it anymore, thank you. Terrible, and it tasted terrible. And as I was, there was this terrible sound. It was my brain doing this buzz, 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 buzz. And I, and I fell into, when I, when I was going under, I imagined there was a little man with a basket going through a garden, and he was plucking flowers, pluck, pluck. And then I realized in this nightmare, he was plucking on my eyes. I have this nightmare, oh, always. Oh, it's, it's terrifying to carry this back there. Now, mothers and fathers and kids all stay together. They practically hold your hand while you're getting the anesthesia. Anyway, that's where my monsters come from, I am sure love you that's fascinating that is truly fascinating it 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 actually it actually goes to uh to what uh dm was saying uh, about his it's like you have taken your trauma you have taken at, at that young age and you have you have turned it into this therapy that you who knows how many people and this is why i keep bringing up your students who knows how many people are better for your films who knows how many people were able to uh to deal with their own traumas by watching you battle your monsters on screen. So I I say once again, you are a, an inspiration to this. And how many years have you been with the festival? I've been screened for seven years. My first marathon was back uh, 35 years ago. So I've been around, I am a Bostonian. And I hope those of you who are on the screen are coming to the festival. I know some people are far away, but welcome to all of you, whether you are here, or in spirit. Uh, he is the spirit of the festival. And I say to anyone who is, and I say this to everyone out there, if you're attending the festival, then then one of the chiefest attractions is, is go and meet the wizard. Uh, we, we know exactly when your show is because it's been flashing across your screen, your Thursday evening. Yes, is that what I saw go by? Yes, uh, 8 p.m. Thursday evening, 8 p.m. Absolutely gorgeous. Bob, I wish I could have seen you this year. I can't get to the festival this year, but but guaranteed next year I'll be there with my ray gun for the 50th anniversary. And, well and, and well we done. must share a flagon of ale when we do. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm gushing over Bob White, but I gush over all of you as well. You have taken trauma, you have taken messages, you have taken thoughts, you have taken dreams, you have taken all of this, and you have given them life in a film that you're sharing with the world. There is nothing braver on this level. There's nothing an artist can do that's any braver than not create a piece, but then hand it to an audience, and you're doing that. And I give you so much credit for doing it. May, may standing ovations occur May it may it uh, bring you much joy and may lots and lots of people be better for seeing your work. Thank you all so much. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know more, you go to bostonsci-fi.com and you won't be sorry. Thank you all very much. An absolute pleasure. Thank you.